Welcome to a very special edition of Travel Today. Now, back in 2005, London was selected to host the 30th Olympic Games. Now, seven years on, the IOC have stated that the city is ready. But what have we got in store for the 10 million ticket holders and estimated 4 billion viewers who are going to be tuning in to the greatest show on the planet? Coming up, I'll be checking out where all of the key action is taking place. I'll be delving into London's Olympic past with a look at the two previous games in the city. Finding out what cultural treats are in store for visitors. And looking beyond the summer at the legacy of the games. The Olympic Games is the world's most prestigious sporting contest. And this summer of 2012, well, it sees London playing host for the third time the only city in the world to have done so. That's three games out of 30, not bad at all. Now, these games have been seven years in the making, and at this point, people may normally question, are they going to be ready on time? Well, London are very proud to announce they are bang on track. The budget, though, has stretched to a whopping £11 billion, but don't worry, the UK capital is promising us an Olympic summer that is going to rock our world. The heart of the Games is the brand new Olympic Park. At a shade under 250 hectares, it's comparable to the size of London's Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens. It houses the major new stadia, including the Olympic Stadium, the Aquatic Centre, London Velo Park, the Basketball Arena, the Water Polo Arena, the Copper Box and the Riverbank Arena and this place, the Olympic Village. Now here, there are nearly 3,000 apartments, which will be home for up to 16,000 athletes and officials during the Games. There are 205 nationalities taking part in the 2012 Olympics. But in London, there are more than 270. So each team taking part in the Games will have Londoners offering home support. There'll be plenty of international supporters too, arriving by train, plane and boat to the UK capital. The main Olympic Park is in Stratford, a completely redeveloped area of East London, which can be reached from the famous West End in just 20 minutes by tube. Events will be taking place all over the UK, but it's the Olympic Park which is the epicentre of the tournament. Construction of the park began in 2008. Now, to get a sense of scale of this place, people can climb this building. It's the largest piece of public art in the country. It's called the Orbit. Or the ArcelorMittal Orbit, to give it its full name. It stands 115 metres tall, and it's going to be one of the many legacies of the 2012 Games. The unusual design is the result of a collaboration between renowned artist Anish Kapoor and the engineer Cecil Baumond. Well, first impressions, it's a bit of a strange looking building. It's kind of like a roller coaster. If you're feeling brave, you can walk up. If you're feeling lazy, take the lift. This is a centrepiece for the London 2012 Games, the Olympic Stadium. It was built in under three years and it holds 80,000 spectators. We're here for a test event, but trust me, come July it's going to be packed to the rafters. The opening ceremony, the closing ceremony and of course the athletics. Let's just hope, please, that the sun comes out. It's surprising that this is only the 30th Olympiad given that the game's roots date back to 776 BC. In ancient Greece, it was more of a regional event than an international one. A rich religious and sporting celebration that took place every four years and lasted until the seventh century. 
The birth of the modern Olympics is partly accredited to a small town called Much Wenlock in Shropshire, England. The name may ring a bell. That's because this little chap is the official mascot of the 2012 games, Wenlock. Back in 1850, Dr. William Brooks created the annual Wenlock Games, partly in order to raise the health of the local community. He developed these games during the same period as the revival of the Athens-based Zappos Olympic Games, even sponsoring prizes at the Greek event. After 40 years of the Wenlock Olympian Society annual games, Baron Pierre de Coubertin visited in 1890 at a Wenlock Games dedicated to him. Inspired, de Coubertin went on to establish the International Olympic Committee, with the inaugural modern Olympic Games taking place six years later in 1896. Nowadays, the Olympic Games have evolved into far more than a sporting competition. The charter for the Games clearly defines how the tournament should be run. Part of that is an extensive programme of cultural events to run during the Olympic period. Jenny Waldman is one of the festival creative producers. The arts took a very important part in the ancient Olympics where artists and sportsmen were side by side really in the Olympics and when de Coubertin uh, started the modern Olympic movement he did so with the three pillars of sports, culture and education. And when London bid for the 2012 Olympics uh, we put arts right back at the heart of the bid. I suppose London and the UK is known for its arts sector and the huge success of theatre and music and fashion and so on around the world that we have uh, in London and in the UK. So we thought that it would be a fantastic opportunity to showcase the best of British culture and also to invite some fantastic artists from around the world to show their work in this wonderful summer of 2012. The London 2012 Festival, which is the culmination of the Cultural Olympiad, runs for 12 weeks from the 21st of June to the 9th of September. And during that time, we have uh, reckoned that there are 10 million free tickets and free opportunities to participate in the festival. It's not just for watching, it's for doing as well. And as, in addition to that, there is uh, three and a half million paid for tickets. Uh, we think we have uh, 25,000 artists performing and uh, showing their work in over 900 venues around the UK. So there's a lot of opportunities both for UK residents and for tourists from abroad to come and watch some of the best of the UK arts and also to take part themselves. It's really hard to, uh, to mention highlights when there are 135 world premieres and another 85 uh, UK premieres. Uh, so for every one of the 81 days of the festival, there's a highlight every day and all over the country. Uh, to give you an example, on the very first day of the festival, on the 21st of June, we have four fantastic events. One is in Stirling, um, just outside Stirling Castle, uh, with Gustavo Dudamel and the Simon Bolivar Symphony Orchestra of Venezuela playing with 60 young children, under 10-year-olds, from the Raplock estate, uh, who have been practicing for a few years now to play with their hero, Gustavo Dudamel. We have a beautiful, large-scale, outdoor event free in uh, the Lake District um, on the shores of Lake Windermere from the French company Le Commando Percu. And uh, we have a Peace One Day concert in the old army barracks of Derry Londonderry in Northern Ireland and a beautiful concert in Birmingham. So that's the first day of the festival. One of the key components of London winning the right to host the 2012 Games was the integration of major landmarks into the roster of venues for the tournaments. Take here the Mall, for example. Presently it's home to the Queen's Buckingham Palace, but come Games time, this will host the climax to the marathon and the road cycling. So where else can tourists swap their souvenirs for spectator seats? Well, here's our pick of venues around the city. Horse Guards Parade will be tying up the horses and hosting the beach volleyball tournament on the parade grounds of the famous Trooping the Colour.
Excel is the vast exhibition space that hosts events such as the World Travel Market and Grand Designs Live. This summer, though, it's going to be hosting boxing, judo, fencing, weightlifting and table tennis. Greenwich Park is a World Heritage Site where Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, kicks off the start of every day from the famous observatory. Its steep banks will be transformed into the equestrian course for jumping, eventing and dressage. Hyde Park is a luscious green space in the heart of London. The pleasure cruisers will be joined by pro athletes for the triathlon and marathon swimming events. The River Lee Country Park has been fringed with a Lee Valley White Water Centre for the Games. It's 30 kilometres north of Stratford and it will be hosting the canoe slalom on its 300 metre course. Lord's Cricket Ground will be hearing the unfamiliar sounds of arrows on targets rather than leather upon willow as archery takes to the home of cricket. Also Wembley, the world famous football stadium, it's going to be hosting the soccer tournament as one of a series of stadiums hosting matches across the country. Others include the Millennium Stadium in Wales and Hampton Park in Scotland. Time now for a short break. Here's what's coming up in part two. We'll be finding out how the city is going to cope with the influx of visitors, looking at the history of the 1908 and 48 London Olympics, finding out about the legacy of the Games, and seeing what Olympic exhibitions and events are taking place across London. Welcome back to a Travel Today London Olympic special. With the 2012 Games just around the corner, all that's left to do is the finishing touches, the major construction work. Well, that was done way ahead of schedule. Take the Aquatic Centre. This magnificent building contains not one, but two Olympic-size or 50-metre pools, as well as a 25-metre diving pool. At a whopping cost of a quarter of a billion pounds, it was welcome news that the state-of-the-art centre opened a full 12 months ahead of schedule. It will be able to host 17,500 people come games time. Making sure the thousands of spectators get safely and quickly to and from the events, well, that's the responsibility of the Mayor's office. Boris Johnson was proud to be part of the Olympic handover four years ago, so we caught up with his team to find out logistically how do you put on such a big event. London, which already has 20 million journeys uh, public, on public transport done a day, was always going to be a big issue for us for the Games time. With an extra million uh, journeys done each day during the, the period of the Games, we've had to be planning in minutiae detail to make sure we get it right. We've had computer modelling, we've had experts who uh, do war games planning for governments, who've been sitting and working out sort of bump out times from stadiums, flows of traffic onto the key line the Jubilee Line and the Central Line. So whilst we do think it will be busy, I think the, the good campaign that we've got, uh, which is called Get Ahead of the Games, which is a national campaign, and as long as people plan, then they'll be able to get around London without any problem, because over 70% of London's public transport will be completely unaffected by it. So I do believe there's a, there's a little bit of the millennium bug about, about the transport issue. People are getting overly nervous. So we generally believe that London, whilst it will be busy, with an extra, over extra million journeys done, a day, um, we think that our transport system, which is one of the best transport systems in the world, will hold up fantastically. With uh, so many international people coming to London, it's the job of the mayor to ensure everybody is safe and secure. Um, we've seen in, uh, obviously, previous host cities um, incidents, and we want to make sure that London remains safe and remains um, accessible to all kinds of people. So whilst the, the news reports always are slightly scaremongering, um, I think that the precautions are being put in place to ensure that people have a safe, secure summer. 